Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are broadcasting live right here in beautiful downtown Columbia, South Carolina. We are just so excited about being here. And all of our brothers and sisters in ecumenical ministries worldwide, thank you so much for taking time to join us. And even you who have come so far to be with us here in the sanctuary, we just thank you so much for taking time to join us. I want to thank my lovely wife for being patient all of yesterday. We had an exciting time in Reedsville, North Carolina. We went up with Bishop Jeffrey Williams to the Founders and Homecoming Anniversary, the 61 celebration of ministry of the Smyrna Church of Christ. And some of you uh, may not know this church, but years ago, Reverend uh, Elder A.C. Jackson, the founder of Bible Way Church, and Pastor Graves founded the South Carolina jurisdiction of Bible Way Church. And I don't know whether you remember seeing the little Bible Way Church on Atlas Road. Well, Smyrna Church of Christ is the exact same church. The same plan was used. And these two great men pioneered and did something extraordinary. They built great churches. Smyrna today is much like Bible Way, a huge edifice and facility. And I sat there, and we remember the old songs of Zion, and we talked about Bishop Smallwood Williams. Many of you have been to Washington, D.C., and if you've ever gone through the city on I-95, you get up to a certain point, and the highway begins to turn and bend. We call that the Bible Way Bend. I-95 was supposed to go straight through Bible Way, but Bishop Smallwood Williams stood right there, and said, not on my watch. And uh, the government, the president, uh, the Washington, D.C. leaders, they made an arrangement that the highway would go around Bible Way Church. But we were giving honor to these great men and the things that they have done. And I began to think about life and who we are and where we are. And uh, so today I want to preach just a simple sermon, and it's more asking than telling. Uh, the title of the sermon probably is something you have heard before. This sermon is about you, just you, nobody else, just you. I mean, it's all about you. Seeing that it's about you, perhaps you ought to take a minute to listen to it. Everywhere you go, People will tell you that in all religions, it's not about you. They will make it plain and clear that it's about something greater than you. They will tell you that you are the least of all that is happening. But this morning, contrary to all that you've heard, this message this morning is all about you. Not your neighbor, not your friend. Not the people you left behind, not the people you're talking, just you and nobody else. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask now that you would come and be in our midst. Fill our spirit, our hearts. Fill us with your presence. Allow your divine presence to open our hearts, our minds, and chiefly our ears that we might hear a word from you. And I ask, oh God, if you would move me out of the way, that whatever I would bring to this message, that it not cause someone to stumble and fall and not hear what you are saying to them. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all those who love the Lord say, Amen. Amen. All those who praise the Lord say, Amen. Amen. And all those who serve the Lord say, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm an old man now. I'm approaching the fourth quarter of my life. One thing that age will do to all of us is cause us to reflect, cause us to consider the lives that we've lived. And just as I reflected this morning, I would have you to reflect. 
not about your fraternity, not about your political party, not even about this church. I would have you to reflect on your life, past, present, and future. You know, most of the time when we give a sermon, we talk about where our scripture and our foundation points are taken from. Well, this morning we are listening uh, from the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. And you've heard them read this morning. And it's basically the Ten Commandments. The Lord is giving us rules to live by. And then this was such a great thing that God himself would line out a prescription for life. But these commandments are very seldom talked about anymore. That they were commandments, then they became suggestions, and then they became weak recommendations. Because most of us now are getting our directions, are getting our understanding of life from somewhere else. Churches in America are slowly emptying. There are very few people who are crowded in a pew. Usually when I go to a church, it looks like COVID is still here. There's so much distance between people that you can just stretch out and take a nap. I say that not jesting, but seriously. When people come to church, they do everything they can to stay awake. They want the music to be loud, and they want the bass to thump through the church. They want activity. They want movement. But they very seldom want reflection. And maybe reflection is something that's out of date and out of touch. But as I was thinking on the fourth quarter of my life, you know, you get the first 25 where you're out the gate and ready to take on anything. You get the second 25 years and you get a mortgage, you get responsibility, and you get questions. In the third 25 years, 50 to 70, you start looking at your wife and your husband and you begin to ask questions. Why did I marry them? Am I stuck and am I free to go? Most divorces take place long before this. Why? Because you didn't have a clear purpose in your marriage, in your association, you did what everybody else expected. And then in late at night, when it's just you and your spouse, you lay there and look at the ceiling fan. <sighs> Maybe you've gained a little weight. Maybe she gained a little more. Maybe you were athletic, but not so much now. Maybe you were popular, but all of them have died. It's just you and you, and you. And you know, when you're thinking about your close relationships, your wife, your children, do you really talk to them anymore? I knew you have your phone, you have TikTok, you have Instagram, you have Pinterest, you have Facebook. Do you really have time to talk to them or even consider them until they want something? Most of our relationships are built and based on wanting something, having a need fulfilled. But I've just been reflecting on this. And maybe it's time that you do too. What is the meaning and purpose, not of your life, but of you living? What does it matter if you lived or if you died? How do you matter? And to whom? You know, I see so many people wanting to be leaders, preachers, teachers, politicians. They want to be leaders. And when you really talk to them and say why, they really don't have an answer. Well, they love the attention. We, we had a young man uh, in the Congress just recently who was able to depose the speaker and they all said it was about him getting on the news. Really? What is the meaning and the purpose of his living? They said that he had a cell phone where he had pictures of young ladies and he would show them on the floors of the Congress. 
You know, we can only see snapshots of others, but we can see ourselves clearly. What is the meaning and purpose of our living? You know, we like to think about our life, our life. But what about our living? Our life is something grand and whole and complete. But our living is daily. Step by step, minute by minute, second by second. We are given average in the U.S. 72.6 years. That breaks down to 871.2 months. In weeks, oh, 3,785 weeks. In days, 26,521.5 days. In hours, 636,507 hours. Seconds, 2,291,427,360 seconds. Now, to think about 72 years is not difficult, especially if you lived every one of them. But when you really break down, what did you do with the time that you were given? You know, a third of it you slept. Uh, uh, Another third of it you worked. And we have come to find out that each one of us have declared that we would bow down to no one. But it seems that you bow down to everyone. Well, except the preacher, of course. If you have a job, you don't even like working. You don't even want to go to work. But you show up every day, grumbling and complaining. And some of you cheerfully go. And you are happy at work, but everybody around you is not. So what's wrong with him? So here you are, either they're grumbling or they're being complained about. Is that how you live your life? They say, well, who are you anyway? You know, we go to great pains to kind of identify ourselves. I was just coming in and I saw that a person had one of these trailer hitches on the back of their car. On the top of it, they had a, a Omega Psi Phi label, and on the bottom they had AKA. Now they went to great pains to get that on the trailer hitch so that somebody coming along would see that. Are, are you defining your life and what you are by your fraternity? Does that give you an idea of what your life is? By a fraternity? Or perhaps you're a Mason or Eastern Star. You you cannot come to a conclusion on who you are out of the context of the group that you associate with. But this is not about them. This is about you. You know all the times you go to all the meetings and you sit there and you never really enjoy a meeting. Somebody said, well, how do you know? Have you been there? Well, I have not. But it is curious to me that if you're in a fraternity or sorority that you drink more liquor than anybody else, and if you're having such a good time, why do you have to leave that drunk? Social interactions. Groups. But what about you? When your children speak of you, if they bother to speak of you, what do they say? Now in America, the children are not speaking favorably of their parents. They don't like school. They don't see the value of it. They hate college. It's too expensive. And what about the ones who decide to participate? They come out with a lot of debt that they can't pay. They're looking for some political solution to an economic problem. But it's your life. You can live it as you please. You know, every morning I wake up, I have a ritual where I would go into the bathroom and the first thing I'm confronted with is a mirror. And unlike you, I have a, a special mirror. I have Alexa on my mirror 
and I don't even have to turn my mirror on. It has lights all around. I said, Alexa, turn on the mirror. And I stand there and smile. Well, it started out that way, 73, 74, 75, and I began to look clearly and see exactly, I don't have long left. What have I done with all of my time? Then my wife would come into the bathroom, and then I really understand how much power I have as she begins to block me out from my mirror and take over the whole counter. Is that all our life is, standing before a mirror? We are sitting there trying to plan our day. Maybe, maybe you have to plan your day. What do you plan your day around? Do you plan it around work? Do you plan it around your children? Or do you plan it around the next meal? You know, this sermon is just about you. You know, I've seen people in programs, and I wonder what do they have to say? What do they think? I went to the NAACP program. And there was our great speaker there. And they began to quote Martin Luther King. And then they began to quote Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, and Soren Kierkegaard. And I said, you know, those are quotes from 100 to 3,000 years, but what do they have to say? You know, all of them who lived a complete life left something. But what are you leaving? You're leaving quotable quotes from someone else? And then we look at what should our life be about? God used to be the center of our life. Before we did simple things, we would pray about it. When was the last time you prayed? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about presenting a laundry list to God. But I mean prayed, had a conversation with God. I want to tell you that I, last night in preparing for this, I prayed. I talked with God. And uh, I came away a little shaken. Maybe you will have this experience if you were to talk with him. He wasn't happy. He wasn't happy with my life. He wasn't happy with the time he gave me. He wasn't happy with what I was doing with it. And I said, but why? But why? He said, have you ever finished anything? I said, oh, God, he sounds like my wife. <laughs> said, what have you worked on? And I wanted to tell him about my high school exploits, that I was a track star, that I was a tennis player, that I played basketball. And this is when I learned the power of a conjunction. I heard God clearly say, and. Well, then I went on to tell him about how I went to college and how I learned so much. But he knew I cheated on the calculus test. He knew I wasn't good at statistics. And he said again, and. So I wanted to search and find meaning in my life. And so I began to tell him about all the politics and the community organizing. I began to tell him about all the changes that we made in the systems of government. And somehow, he didn't seem to be impressed. And so then I reached way down. And I talked about my international exploits. How we are building churches. I knew he'd like that. How we are building hospitals and how we are going and taking care of the least of these. And he said, and? So, Lord, what am I to do? What is the value of my life? I was looking at the University of South Carolina football team and what it takes to participate 
Well, let's not look at the football team. Let's look at the ladies' basketball team. What it takes to be a winner. I look at the hours upon hours of dedication and repetition, all that they pour in it, just so that they would have a statistical sheet and go on to make money and to be able to do something with the money that doesn't amount to anything. When I was just trying to find the meaning of life, I came across something on the Internet that made me ask something about myself. In 100 years, like in the year 2123, we will all be buried with our relatives and friends, all dead. Strangers will live in our homes that we fought so hard to buy, so hard to build. They will own everything we have today. All of our possessions will be unknown and unborn, including the car we spent a fortune on and that will probably be now scrapped, preferably in the hands of an unknown collector. Our descendants will hardly know who we were, nor will they even remember us. How many of us know our grandfather's father and after we die, we will be remembered for a few more years. And then we're just a portrait of someone on someone's bookshelf. And a few years later, our history, our photos, our deeds, they all disappear in history oblivion. We won't even be memories. You know, I think sometimes, like, when I'm going across Facebook... I come across friends of mine who I know have passed. But their Facebook page is still there. And I'm wondering, what will they say about my Facebook page? Nothing, they'll just move on. If we could think about all of this as we approach life every day, then we could see what great value there is in a relationship with God. Without a God, a man is just a trivial puzzle. Without God, a man is just a rudderless boat. Without God and a supreme connection, we are really dust waiting for the wind to blow. It is God that gives us purpose and meaning. And the issuing of these commands was not for him, but for us. It was to give us a way to measure ourselves, to hold ourselves accountable. And say, well, what is the purpose of church? What is the purpose of religion? Some say it is to moderate our action. Some say it's to hold and control the population. But God is a purpose that man cannot even describe. Because first, it takes a relationship with God before you can have a decent relationship with others. If you can't have a relationship with a God that's perfect, how can you have relationship with the rest of us? When you consider who God is and whether there's a God in your life, then you begin to understand what your life was really worth. Some people have turned football into their God. The saddest thing I've ever seen was the Football Hall of Fame. When I saw Jim Brown amble up to get his jacket. When I saw all the broken men on crutches and canes trying to walk up. And they spent their entire life pursuing something that in the end they can't even walk up to get. When I, when I look at all the people who've had all the money that they could have. I, I told you about the billionaire. When the billionaire died, when Steve Jobs was laying on his deathbed without a God, without a purpose, the Apple computer meant nothing. His money meant nothing. He said this. He said, you can pay a man to drive you around. You can pay a man to work and make money for you. But you can't pay anyone to take on your cancer and suffer and die for you. Steve Jobs, having everything, was at a loss in finding meaning in his life. 
And then we look at the legacy that he left. Steve Jobs left a legacy, a personal computer that will be unrivaled for the next hundred years. But what is the value of it? Another toy, another trinket? So I'm beginning to think about my life, and I hope you are, because that's what this sermon is about. Can I tell you what to do with your life? No, it's not for me. But I can tell you that there is one greater than you. I'll tell you that the man Job had to question this God. Question how could he be a higher power? How could he know? And he looked at Job and said, Job, is there any permanence in your life? Is there any substantial thing in your life? Because where were you when I flung the stars throughout the heavens and they're still there? Where were you, Job, when I set the galaxy ablaze in the heavens? Where were you? Job, where were you when I created the earth? And so, like God, created in his own image, surely there must be something that I can do other than take pictures of red bottom shoes. I'm sorry, sweetie. I know you hate for me to bring up those shoes again. But do you know that people measure who they are, who they are, by the bottoms of their shoes? There, there are people, and we, we've seen the children in Africa that's su- suffering with infected feet with jiggers and worms, and we've seen the guinea worm that President Carter just almost eliminated. And these people are buying these shoes but have no consideration for others and yeah. how they walk. But that's not a measure in their life. Who am I to tell them that they shouldn't wear shoes and they should help someone? If they have no innate desire to be of help to someone else, why should I tell them? Because only a God could give such an example. I go to the hospital and I walk down the cancer ward. You know, when I go to football games, I, I walk up to people and ask them, would you like for me to pray for you? <laughs> really? <laughs> Sir, would you like for me to pray for you? Nobody wants me to pray for them <laughs> at the football game, except when I'm at a Carolina football game, they want me to pray for the team. Amen. But if you walk down the cancer ward, man, People find out that you know God. They want you to come into the room. But isn't it a little late? What is the purpose of God in our society? Well, uh, Christensen, a professor at Harvard, had a Chinese student from mainland China to come. And he took up economics. Economics. And Christensen, the professor, was interested in knowing why would a Chinese communist who has a whole different economic system, why would he come to Harvard to learn economics? And so when the student was graduating, he invited him over to dinner so that they could talk. And Christensen was curious about the life that he was living the purpose, the meaning. And so he asked him, why do you come here? He said, this is a unique experience. And Christian said, said, how so? We are much like you. We eat, we drink, we have families. He said, no, you are different. Christian said, well, how are we different from the Chinese? He said, nowhere else in the world do people act like you. He said, what do you mean? He said, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and you're in your car driving, and there's no one else on the road at all. And you roll up to a stoplight, and it's red. You stop. No one else in the world stops. Christensen thought about it a moment. He said, there is some truth to that. But why is that such a fascination to you? He said, you have inculcated the laws of the country into the customs and mores. 
that people are obeying things that they assume are connected to a higher power. He said, now, we have rules and laws and punishments, yet they don't stop. So Christensen asked him, said, well, what do you attribute this to? He said, you have an unseen hand and an unseen teacher. He said, well, who is that hand and how does it affect us? He said, on every community, on every street, there is a church. And in your country, you have something called God who's a moderating and mediating force of every activity. And said, because you have that God, you have those churches that are not controlled by the state, that are not paid for by the state, that they're free independent associations where they elect their own leaders. They're not party leaders. They're separate and apart from the government. And yet, because of the morals, because of the rules, because of the commandments in them, two o'clock in the morning, that man stops. We call that the rule of law and order. They go right back to these laws that Moses gave the people, that God carved out the Ten Commandments. That man stopping at two o'clock in the morning has something to do with that. He's responding to a higher call. Well, what happens when that's gone? Well, we've seen what happens. You've seen hundreds of children running to the Apple store, break down the glass, take all the iPhones, and run out. Well, those children did not go to that church. They did not have a God. They worship materialism. You've seen it when the police officer comes and stops someone and he has no respect for life. And he pulls out his gun and he shoots him. Why? Because he has no respect for person. You've seen the breakdown of religion. You've seen the breakdown of respect for one another because there is no God. Someone asked me, said, well, are you going to run for office? Are you going to try to make more rules? No. Here in this pulpit is where the truth is told and the relationship begins. When we fail in this pulpit, when we turn the blind eye, when we fail to attract, and a, then we see the never-ending story where our lives begin to deteriorate. When we allow others to raise up the fraternity, the social organization, the political organization, when we get them out of kilter, then we are lost. Somebody asked me, said, well, why do grandmother wear Daisy Duke's shorts now? Why do they have their midriff out? It's simple. There's no moral authority. There's no answer to the way we're living and how we're living. There's no one to ask. What is the meaning and purpose of your living? Is it your nails? Not your whole body, but a part of your body. Is it your eyelashes? Is it your signed, safely sexy body? Is that your meaning and purpose? When the mother of the family is given over to carnal things, what happens to the children? What happened to their desire to reach higher goals and higher attainments? This sermon is about you. So it's just little things. Getting up and looking into the mirror. My wife wanted to know why do I pray in the bathroom? Why, why are you praying? And I showed her the mirror. If that's not a reason to pray. But just being there to whisper a little prayer. A prayer that will define my meaning and my purpose in life. A prayer to ask God for direction. Ask God for instructions. You know, the Bible used to be something called basic instructions before leaving earth. We've forsaken our instructions. 
Sometimes people ask me, what do you do with slavery, oppression, exploitation? It's simple. Our Bible is filled with the richest history of people overcoming. When we look at the book of Jeremiah, it gives us a clear pattern of what do you do. And so, well, this is just a history. Yes, it is something we can learn from. This is God's word, instructions for us. People get to Jeremiah 29 and 11. They said, oh, the word says God has promised us good things. But verses 4 through 10 said, well, we should get married. We should have an honest relationship with another human being in the presence of God and goodness and righteousness and holiness and commitment. We should have a wife or a husband that we can share our living with. We should do the things necessary to feed ourselves, clothe ourselves. We should have a garden. These are God's instructions. We should be able to marry our children and build our legacy. What we are today, we should be able to pass on for 10 generations. If that's goodness, then the society around us will prosper. If it's wickedness, lasciviousness, then the society will crumble. Here in America, just because of me and you, it's all about you. The society is not in good shape. And some want to turn it differently, but it can only be turned by meaningful, purposeful, holy living. When one man's wife is his wife, not our wife. When one woman's husband is her husband, not our husband. When we respect boundaries, when we respect one another. Change can only come in relationships. You know, so many people have asked, how is it that the African American could survive slavery? How could we start from 1619 and make it today and still prosper? It's simple. The story of our 400 years are the same story of Joseph starting out in Egypt. 400 years of slavery and suddenly a delivery by God. You know, we have prayed as African Americans the whole time we were here. And someone said, well, how did you liberate yourself? What army did you use? What tactics did you use? What lawyers did you use? But quiet is kept. The Civil War was not even fought mostly by us. It was fought because of us. And when you look at To Kill a Mockingbird, you'll see that there were some other people who were instrumental in our freedom that wasn't even like us. That God has sent some before us to battle for us, to provide resources for us. You know, there was a man named Julius Rosenwald. He was a poor Jew that came to this country and worked in menial jobs until he made real money. And he asked the question, what is the meaning and purpose of my living? Not his life, of his living. And Julius Rosenwald said, I want to see that African Americans have schools, that they learn to read and write, that they are able to do something other than pick cotton. And so Julius Rosenwald erected, constructed 5,300 schools all across America to educate African-American children. And because of this, there grew an educated population. There grew out of that African-American colleges and universities because one man thought his life worth living was by opening the door for others. There are students who are still calling his name. Up in Prosperity, South Carolina, there's a Rosenwald School. In Charleston, South Carolina, there's a Rosenwald School. Surely, with our income, with our influence, we can build tomorrow if our lives have meaning. 
My brothers and sisters, I won't belabor the point, but I would ask you to consider having a God in your life, a God in your society, a God in your relations, a God in your family, a God principle in everything that you do. For what is successful living if not being prepared for eternity? Eternity and the hereafter, but the eternity of those who live after you here. That you would leave something meaningful that won't be old and out of style like red bottom shoes, like flashy suits, junk heap cars. Leave something. And the greatest thing that you can leave is a legacy of love for one another. And if today you have come by this message and knowing that it's all about you, your eternal future, then I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. That you would acknowledge all of your sins, all of your shortcomings, and all of the ways you've erred. And say, Lord, forgive me. I've wasted time. I've done stupid and dumb things. And yes, I've sinned. But I'm asking for forgiveness. If you would just pray that simple prayer. Lord, forgive me. And Lord, I want to make you the head of my life. Your purity. Your holiness. Your righteousness. Lord, I want that to be my reason and purpose for living. That everything I do, everything I touch from this point on that it would have a holy, righteous meaning. Come, sit on the throne of my heart. Help me navigate the rest of my years that I may be a benefit to others eternally. If you prayed that simple prayer, then you become a member of the household of faith, the kingdom of God. You've established a relationship with the one who made us all, and he will guide you to greater things. In Jesus' name. Let us stand. Lord, we entreat you today that you will let us be selfish for a moment, that we reflect on who we are, what we are, and what we've been and what we can become. Give us the tools to overcome our own carnal desires, our own selfish interests, and have godly interests, holy interests, pure interests, greater interests, have an interest in you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all those who love the Lord say, Amen. all those who praise the Lord say, Amen. and all those who serve the Lord say, Amen. Amen. Be blessed and go in peace.